All right, welcome everybody to the fifth uh, speaker in our, oops, I don't think my, sorry, but I think, I'm not sure the live stream is working. Hang on a sec, because it looks, I see an error. Just give me half a second to check this. Oop, I got ahead of myself. I, I will fix this in post, if not. All right, welcome okay. everybody. It's working on, on one side, so we'll, uh, We'll go from there. Okay. Sorry about that. Welcome everybody to our uh, the fifth speaker in our 2022-2023 speaker series. Today, we're very excited to host Dr. James Den uh, Densley from Metropolitan State University, and he'll be speaking on uh, the Violence Project, how to stop a mass shooting epidemic. Uh, Dr. Densley is a professor and department chair of criminology and criminal justice at Metro State University, which is part of the Metro State, or the, sorry, the Minnesota State System. He's also co-founder and co-president with Jillian Peterson of the Violence Project, a nonpartisan nonprofit research center best known for its mass shooter database, which was funded by the National Institute for Justice. And I will, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Densley, and uh, looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, greatly appreciate the invitation and nice to connect with uh, colleagues old and new. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, here so I can walk through some of the slides and just really to keep me on track for this talk. And uh, as was mentioned, this uh, talk is called The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic. And it's based on a research project that is about five or so years in the making uh, now uh, that I will that I'll walk through uh, as we speak. So the culmination of the project is actually a book. The book is titled The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic. And I want to flag for the audience here uh, two important uh, takeaways from the book, which are really the central thesis of this talk. The first is the opening chapter to the book, which is titled Monsters. There is a prevailing wisdom in society that mass shooters are monsters, that they are madmen, that they are inherently evil, and that because uh, you can't do anything about evil, evil people will do evil things. Therefore, there is nothing we can do about mass shootings. Now, there's no question that what they have done is monstrous. But before they ever pulled the trigger, they were somebody's brother somebody's son, somebody's nephew, somebody's uh, colleague, classmate, or neighbor. And if we'd have seen them for the human being that they were before they perpetrated the crime, I genuinely believe that we could have prevented the tragedies from occurring. And it's not just a belief, it's actually something that the evidence and the data support. And that's what I'm gonna be sharing here today. And then I also want to direct you to the title of chapter nine of the book, which is titled Hope. It's pretty easy to feel hopeless when we are in a perpetual cycle of mass shootings. Every time we switch on the news and we hear about another one, and then we go back to our business as usual politics of pitting imperfect solutions one off of each other, pointing fingers, offering thoughts and prayers, and then not actually acting. But we genuinely came away from this project with hope. Hope that mass shootings are not an inevitable part of American life, but they are truly preventable. And in the book, we outline over 30 solutions for the mass shooting problem. And I'll talk about those in more detail uh, as we move forward. So what is the Violence Project? Well, the Violence Project started as a code name for a research study. And that study was to look at the life histories of mass shooters in the United States. My colleague, Gillian Peterson, who is a psychologist at Hamlin University, and myself were growing increasingly frustrated with the level of discourse around mass shootings in the United States. Now, Gillian's background was once as a special investigator on death penalty cases in the New York Capitol Defender's Office. My background was as a middle school special education teacher, and then, of course, as an academic. But I studied mostly gangs and organized crime 
and sort of everyday gun violence. And Jill's research was mostly around mental illness and violence. We were not really studying mass shootings, but we decided that we wanted to try and contribute something to the conversation around this, because every time one of these things occurred, it seemed that we were using the same talking points and sound bites over and over again, that it was the violent video games, or it was mental illness, or it was marijuana, or whatever it was that was driving people to shoot one another. Now, today, the Violence Project is more than just a code word for a research study. It's evolved to become its own nonpartisan, nonprofit research center, where we continue to advance what has been a central theme of the work that we've done to date, which is public criminology. Now, there's a, a vast literature on the idea of public criminology. Um, this idea of being public facing in the work that we do in recognition that when you are studying an issue like mass shootings, this has public policy and practice implications, and it's of great interest to the general public because there is a fear of these events in society and that they drive sometimes quite irrational responses. For instance, in the United States, we run our kids through active shooter drills and we will send them to school with bulletproof backpacks because of an attempt to feel safe in these environments. So we made it a real point of this project to try and disseminate information publicly and to be very uh, public facing in the work that we have done with the Violence Project. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. Okay. So the Violence Project is a study of mass shootings. The first question, of course, is what is a mass shooting? And to be honest, we only have an hour here today. And if we wanted to get into the nuances of this, it would take a lot longer. So I'm just going to define it here as four or more people killed in a public space. And those shootings are not associated with other felony crimes. It's a very narrow definition. It's one that has been in existence for 20, 30, 40 years, but it is an imperfect definition. It excludes domestic shootings, for instance, which are the most common form of mass shooting. It excludes shootings where multiple people are shot and injured, but we don't reach that threshold of four or more people killed. And there's lots of reasons why it's imperfect, but there's also lots of reasons why, as with any social scientific endeavor, definitions matter. And this is a very specific phenomena. A mass public shooting is different and has different dynamics than domestic violence or a gang-related shooting, for instance. And the literature there was very strong. There seemed to be a gap in our knowledge around this particular phenomena, and that's what we focus on here uh, in this study. So what did we actually do? And again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the complete nuances of methodology, but it, to suffice it to say that we built a database of mass public shooters. Now, notice I said shooters, not shootings. This is important. A lot of databases were already in existence, which were tallying the shootings when they occurred. But they weren't necessarily doing a deep dive into the life histories of the perpetrators. And that's what sets apart our work from the others. The, really, our unit of analysis is the shooter, not the shooting. We've coded these individuals on over 180 different variables. So we look at everything from their childhood, their upbringing, their mental health, their physical health, whether they played violent video games, whether they were using marijuana, and all the other things that the public is interested in when it comes to understanding these individuals, including how they got access to firearms. So this project started in 2017, and it accelerated in 2018 when we received funding from the National Institute of Justice to really take this work to the next level. Now, the funding from NIJ was just for two years. So it dried up in 2020, but the work hasn't ended because mass shootings haven't ended. So we continue to update the database and we make it publicly available so that people can interact with it 
and they can spot errors in the database. They can ask questions about it and they can make suggestions for other variables that we can include in the latest versions of it. So we're now in the sixth iteration of the database that just came out in the last month and we will be continuing to add cases as they occur. Now the NIJ funding was not just for the database, which by the way is built on publicly available information. And again, we could talk methodology all day, but there's pros and cons with using public information. We try and triangulate that information. We try and rely on the most uh, valid sources and reliable sources. We are really using as best we can primary source material, but a lot of it does come from media reporting, which has its biases and inaccuracies and imperfections. But it's a publicly available database built on public data. And in addition to that, we are trying to triangulate that with qualitative interviews. So it's a mixed method study. It's not just the database, but it's also a series of interviews. And that's really what the crux of the book is about. We interviewed living incarcerated mass shooters who had been imprisoned for these crimes. Now that's a very small N, by the way, someone who'd killed four or more people in a public space and had lived to tell the tale, which I will explain a little bit more about later. But in addition to the mass shooters that we interviewed, and by the way, we did that largely because of the pandemic, but also because of the restrictions of getting into US prisons through letters and telephone. And in some case, we corresponded 20, 30, 40 times back and forth with letters, with questions that they answered about their lives. We also interviewed people who knew mass shooters. That included their parents, their siblings, their teachers, their social workers. And to try and understand all aspects of this phenomena, we interviewed survivors of mass shootings. We interviewed first responders. We interviewed victims' families who'd lost loved ones. We spent time in the communities where these shootings had occurred. So the attempt here was to try and understand this phenomena from all angles and to triangulate that information to come toward a better understanding of mass shootings. Okay, some key findings from this research study. Even when you control for population size, because the America is bigger today than it, is, uh, than it was uh, in previous years, um, you can see that mass shootings have become more frequent and they have become deadlier over time. There used to be a time when we only had one or two of these types of high profile mass shooting events every year. Now we're averaging five to six of those events. And if you just think back to last year, you can almost tally on your hand those events because you remember them. You can think about, for instance, the shooting in Buffalo, New York, or in Highland Park on the 4th of July parade, or in Uvalde, Texas, or at the shooting in Chesapeake in Virginia at the Walmart. And so we are seeing increased regularity of these shootings. And as I mentioned, they are becoming deadlier as well. So if you look at the data here, you will notice that some of the deadliest shootings, which are the ones in red, have occurred in just the last decade. All the ones in red on this screen have occurred in the last decade. This screen, by the way, goes all the way back 100 years. This is 100 years of mass shootings, the deadliest shootings, and the ones in red are all in the last 10 years. Now, our database goes back to 1966. The reason for that is because that shooting in 1966 at the University of Texas, Austin, is widely regarded as the first modern mass shooting because it's an event that unfolded live on radio and on the new medium of television. And it was that moment where this phenomena was beamed into people's homes and became part of the American uh, story. But there have been mass shootings prior to that event, as this table shows. What we see in terms of this rising frequency and deadliness is there are lots of different variables at play here, but our data enable us to at least interrogate some of the big critical questions that are often asked about mass shootings in the United States. So for instance, what was the role of the federal assault weapons ban 
in terms of having a reduction in these types of events? Well, as you can see from the data in front of you, it's pretty inconclusive as to what that ban achieved. But what we can tell you is that assault weapons feature in mass shootings at an astonishing rate versus everyday gun violence. And that you can see that in the last 10 years, nearly half of all the mass shooting cases have involved a weapon that would have been banned under that assault weapons ban, which was in effect from 1994 to 2004. The prevalence of assault weapons in mass shootings is interesting because it's not just about the utility of the weapon, because any semi-automatic weapon in the wrong hands is deadly. But there's something about a copycat phenomena with mass shootings, where if you want your performance, because that's what these shootings are, a spectacle, to conform with the genre conventions of what a mass shooting looks like to the public, then you have to use the same props as the previous mass shooters have used before you. And there is an element of particularly AR-15 style assault weapons, conforming to that narrative around, if you want a mass shooting to look like a mass shooting, then you have to use this type of weapon. So a little rundown of some of the key findings from our study. Who are the mass shooters? Because as I mentioned before, we were really interested in the life histories of the individuals themselves, and not just an examination of the routine activities of the events. It will perhaps come as no surprise that mass shooters tend to be men. 98% of the individuals in our data are men. There are only four women in the entire database and two of those four women were perpetrating their crimes with men. And again, we could have an entire hour on masculinity, aggrieved entitlement, uh, and so on, which may be underpinning some of this particular uh, uh, phenomena. But we know that in terms of this uh, particular type of violence, which is also true of most types of violent crime, by the way, uh, men are the perpetrators. In terms of the age of mass shooters, the uh, average age is 34 years old. Um, the Median age is 33, um, and the modal age is 21. We actually see a quite a lot of clustering at those young ages, which explains, by the way, the mean and the median. We actually see clusters in the 20s and clusters in the 40s, and they average out to an age in the 30s. But the more important finding is that it varies depending on place. Mass public shootings that occur in K-12 school shooting uh, settings, for instance, are much more likely to be perpetrated by K-12 school children. And so they trend younger, as you can see on the chart in front of us. Shootings that occur in factories, office spaces, and in governmental buildings, which tend to be uh, perpetrated by individuals with an existing relationship, usually as a workplace shooting, tend to trend older. And again, this makes sense if you think about we are human beings who are creatures of habit, and we tend to target the places that we know the best. We also maybe have an underlying grievance with the, with the place, hence this type of uh, breakdown. And in terms of race, one interesting way in which our data challenges some of the conventional narratives around mass shootings is there is a perception in society that mass shooters are exclusively white men. But what the data actually show is that they are relatively proportionate to the US general population. In fact, white mass shooters are underrepresented, black mass shooters are overrepresented, and Latinx mass shooters are actually massively underrepresented in the data. But again, it varies by location. So what you see is these interesting sort of trends where, for example, shooters at house of worship who tend to be targeting those locations because of an underlying maybe ideological uh, white supremacist agenda tend to be white. Whereas shooters in governmental buildings and in workplaces may be more diverse, and that might be reflective of 
perhaps institutionalized racism in society and grievances being attached to the workplace. Okay, I'm gonna outline now four what we think are the most important findings when it comes to thinking about prevention. Because in the end, when you're studying something like mass shootings, the data are the data, but there is value in descriptive analysis just as much as there is in some of the high uh, profile fancy statistical work that usually is done in the criminological field. And even descriptive statistics from a cross-sectional sample like this, we think can be quite illustrative to rethinking this phenomena and how we go about saving lives. So first and foremost, in some of those locations that I just mentioned, factories, office buildings, governmental spaces, these tend to be workplace shootings. In college or university settings, K-12 school shoot, uh, settings, and also houses of worship, there's usually some sort of existing connection between the shooter and the location. This is important because there's an entire multi-billion dollar safety industry predicated on the idea that mass shooters are outsiders that we can lock out. But in fact, mass shooters are insiders. They are people that we know. They're walking through that same security, just like the rest of us. And so we have to be much more attuned to what's going on in the lives of the people around us to recognize them before they become the shooter. Another finding is that mass shooters are individuals who are in crisis. Now, a crisis is a marked change in behavior from baseline. It's observable and it overwhelms your usual coping mechanisms. It manifests itself in lots of different ways depending on the individual. But we were able to look at things like increased agitation, abusive behavior, isolation, in some cases a losing touch with reality, depressed mood, mood swings, and inability to perform daily tasks, paranoia, as signs of a crisis. And in many cases, these shooters prior to the shooting were exhibiting multiple signs of a crisis, which has implications for practice. If we can train ourselves to recognize those signs and to actually intervene with somebody in crisis, we might be able to save lives. Now we wrote a lot about this in a recent op-ed that we published with the New York Times, where in this op-ed, it's a sort of interactive design, you're able to actually read the narratives of the mass shooters in terms of the uh, description of the exact type of crisis that they were going through. And this is important because mass shooters uh, um, are really individuals who are asking existential questions about their place in the world. And mass shootings tend to be driven by despair. And this is important because it changes the way we think about prevention in terms of the calculus that people go through from a deterrence standpoint. Our data and other studies have confirmed that mass shooters are often suicidal. About a third of the individuals in our data were suicidal prior to the attack. They had attempted suicide previously, they had written about suicide previously, and in about uh, four in 10 cases, the intent was to die in the act, whether they took their own lives or they were killed by law enforcement. And about 60% of all mass shooters actually do die on the scene. Now, why this is important is because if you think about mass shootings as a final act, nobody gets away with a mass shooting. There's not a plan to slip on a disguise, run for the border and live happily ever after. A mass shooting only really ends in one of three ways, which is that you take your own life, it's taken for you by law enforcement, or you spend the rest of your life in prison. And depending on the state, you will face the death penalty. That changes the way we think about, for instance, armed security in our public spaces, perhaps they're not a deterrent to this type of crime, but it may be an incentive to perform it. Now, I know that sounds like a pretty dramatic statement, but let's take it from the words of somebody who perpetrated a school shooting. 
Now, by the way, this is a case that's not in our database because this person didn't kill four people. They only killed the principal and the custodian of the school, but they did injure eight other individuals at school, plus a police officer. Now, during their parole uh, hearing, they were asked, why did you commit this crime? Now, this was an important question to ask this particular individual, by the way, because when they were asked it originally after perpetrating the crime, the answer was, I hate Mondays. And I hate Mondays became a famous pop song. But later in life, when asked that same question, the perpetrator answered very differently. Because I wanted to die was the answer. I was trying to commit suicide. Then why did you pick the school across the street, the commissioner asked, and they said, because I knew if I'd fired on the school, the police would show up and they would shoot and kill me. Every time I tried suicide in the previous year, I'd screwed it up. Now, we ourselves in our interviews with mass shooters heard very similar narratives. One of the school shooters in our book that we interviewed, not this individual, also said something very similar. Their intent was for the school resource officer to shoot and kill them. It didn't happen that way. The school resource officer just rugby tackled them and they ended up spending the rest of their lives in prison. But a mass shooting was, and always is, intended to be a final act. Now, the other piece that we see with this is that in the preparation for that final act, mass shooters leak their plans. About 25% of mass shooters in our data studied other mass shooters. They literally identified with them. They were asking that question of, why do I feel the way that I feel? And they were going searching for answers to that question. And they do what we all do. They Googled it. And unfortunately, when you Google these types of questions, you go tumbling down the rabbit hole and radicalized in chat forums where mass shooters are heroized and celebrated in the darkest corners of the internet. About half of all the mass shooters in our data leaked their plans ahead of time, that there was clearly those warning signs, often to peers or co-workers, but one of the biggest challenges is that people didn't know what to do with that information. They were asking that question of, well, they're not really that bad, are they? And I don't want to be a snitch. And yeah, maybe that could happen, but I don't want to get anybody in trouble. We actually had a parent of a mass shooter ask us, what would you have us do? Like, call 911 on my own child? Now, with hindsight, the answer to that would have been yes, you could have saved lives. But it, it highlighted the predicament that this person was in. When a law enforcement punishment-led response is the only response, people are reluctant to report and that these things fall through the cracks time and time again. Now, what we've also found in our research is that some of the strongest predictors of whether or not people will leak their plans are age, younger people tend to be more outspoken about these crimes, whether or not they've been through prior counseling, and whether or not they were actively suicidal. It changes the way we think about this. It's not just a narcissistic act of fame seeking, but it's also an element of really communicating harm because it's a cry for help. And if it's a cry for help, a last ditch attempt to see, will anybody pay attention and notice me and we don't respond, then the violence follows. So these key findings lay a foundation in our work for what we call not a profile of a mass shooter, because that's not what we're in the business of doing, but a pathway to a mass shooting. We outline this in detail in the book. There's not enough time to go through it in laborious detail here today. But we find that there's a lot of early childhood trauma in the lives of mass shooters, which lays a foundation because it's unresolved for the crisis that follows later in life that overwhelms that person's usual coping mechanisms. The crisis is often a suicidal crisis, and it's at that time where people start to mobilize toward this type of violence. They start to research other shooters, identify with those that have gone before them, and become radicalized to this type of a violence, which then means that what is next is the opportunity to perpetrate the crime. 
If you can get access to the people and places that are representative of your grievance and access to firearms, then you have the uh, violence uh, that follows. Now, there are implications for all of this. So as an example, one of the uh, safest things that we can do is promote things like safe storage. Over 80% of the school shooters in our research got their firearms from home. By virtue of age, they couldn't go out and purchase them on their own. Safe storage is an example of a way we could address that opportunity part of the equation. Because this is the thing that we try and advance in our work. If you think about those four steps on the pathway as four inflection points, each one is an opportunity for intervention. But for too long, all we've done is focused on the opportunity component, which is not getting upstream enough of the crime before it occurs. So yes, there's work to be done in opportunity. This is a prime example of it. But there's more that can be done on the front end to address trauma, crisis, and that scripting and social proof that can also save lives going forward. The work we believe has a broad diffusion of benefits as well. So you take that example of safe storage of firearms, which may prevent a mass shooting, but what it might also do is prevent an accidental shooting in the home. It might prevent a firearm from being stolen, winding up on the streets, and then being used in an everyday homicide. So when we think about how we go about solutions to mass shootings, it's not that we do it just to prevent mass shootings. We do it because it also can impact other forms of gun violence and harm as well. We want to address the crisis point because there are too many people in our schools and in our workplaces now who are driven by despair, who are overwhelmed with the state of the world, and that we need to be doing uh, more to help. So as one of our interviewees told us, you do this not because you're trying to stop the next mass shooter, you do it because it's the right thing to do, to create a culture of care and compassion in all of our schools and workplaces and communities, that people can feel seen and not feel like violence is a solution to their problems. Now, the analogy that often got used during the global pandemic was this of Swiss cheese. And we write about this in the book too. For too long, we've pitted imperfect solutions off of each other. So what we've tried to do with the book is to layer solutions. We talk about things that you can do to stop a mass shooting at the societal level. And that may require an act of Congress and it may require some action from policymakers, and it may require some funding to really achieve the, the, the real goal. But we also talk about things you can do at the institutional level, in schools, in workplaces, in communities. For instance, building threat assessment or crisis response teams in schools, or to uh, promote safe storage of firearms and so on. And then things we can do at the individual level, mentoring the young people around us, uh, pledging right here, right now, that if you have a gun in the home and a teenager, you'll keep it locked up and secured. That if we layer those solutions at the societal, institutional, and individual, you can tell I was a gang researcher, by the way, it's very Jim Short, um, then you know what I'm talking about in terms of trying to get to a better solution. Swiss cheese, right? Each one of these things has holes in it. But if you layer them one on top of each other, the holes start to fill in and you get toward a more perfect solution. That's really the intent with the recommendations that we make in the book, is to recognize that there is no one size fits all. But we also don't need to pit mental health off against guns, because it can be all of the above if we go about it in the right way. And it also doesn't have to infringe upon anyone's Second Amendment rights or the other big political sticking points. OK, in the last bit of time I've got before we open up for some questions, I want to come back to this point that we've been trying to intentionally do this work through the lens of public criminology to practice what this means. 
And I want to just talk through what we think it means, what we've been trying to do with the project, but also the pros and cons of public criminology as we try and promote it for others to be thinking about in their own research. Now, it really started for us with this op-ed in the LA Times. Now, I'll let you in on a little secret with this op-ed. We shopped it to some other locations before the LA Times, and they all told us no. Not only that, the LA Times also told us no. So the first thing about public criminology is you must be persistent. If you think it's hard to get into a peer-reviewed journal, I assure you it's a lot harder to get into the New York Times. But you just have to keep trying. And here's the reality. Timing is everything. We submitted this op-ed at a time when there hadn't been a mass shooting, and it was rejected. But 48 hours later, there had been a spate of mass shootings, including one in El Paso, Texas, at a Walmart that killed over 20 people. And the editor at the LA Times contacted us and said, yeah, we were a little hasty on that reject. Maybe we should publish, which they did on a Sunday. And this article was uh, read over a million times in the first few days of its publication. It went viral on social media, which was a very sort of overwhelming experience. And it was getting support from all sides of the aisle in terms of this holistic approach to thinking about the mass shooting phenomena. And it was at that moment where we realized that this research project was more than just the research projects that we've been accustomed to doing previously. So what we did is we turned the violence project into a non profit organization in an attempt to keep the research alive because the NIJ funding had dried up, but the mass shootings hadn't gone away and the public still had those same questions and they wanted a place to go to find answers. It also turned out that practitioners had questions and they wanted resources that they could use to actually affect change within their organizations and within their communities. So we built a spin-off website called Off-Ramp. It's a little cheesy, but we say the road to violence is long and you've got to build more off-ramps. So you, we now have a hub for information for people to engage with. So the question is, do people engage with it? Well, there's one way of looking at that, which is you can look at the data. So in the aftermath of the shooting in Uvalde, Texas, for instance, that website got... 42,000 visitors, and we had about 82,000 page views of the database, which by the way, we gave away for free. And a lot of people in academia thought we were crazy to do so, because when you build a database, you should therefore publish off of it into perpetuity, and that's how you build your career. But instead, we made the database publicly available before we ever published anything with it. We wanted to get it into the hands of other academics, researchers, graduate students, journalists, the general public, so they could interact with it and they could use it for the same reason we wanna use it too, which is to stop mass shootings. So this has really been about public dissemination of data. Yes, we've published in academic peer-reviewed journal articles, but we've also published a number of op-eds in the following outlets, everything you see in front of us. And we've also collaborated with um, the New York Times, ProPublica, Voice for America, the LA Times, on a series of works that have tried to translate the database into tangible findings for the public. One of the highlights of this, I think, for us was being the cover story of Time magazine uh, after the shooting at Uvalde as a way of, again, trying to communicate our findings to a general audience that really is the ones on the ground addressing this phenomena and trying to do something about it outside of the ivory tower. We've tried to publish in open access journals. We're very committed to the ideas around open science for this reason. And then the book was published with not an academic publisher, but with a mainstream uh, publisher, 
And I can safely say that for the first time in my life, um, I was ahead of Truman Capote um, on the charts when it came to uh, book sales because of the appetite for this type of a work. If you make it accessible, people will engage with it. And that's something that we genuinely believe in the course of this work. Now, a lot of this involves a lot of media uh, work, which at times is exhausting because you are basically saying the same thing over and over and over again to, to the, uh, the audience. And there are times where in the aftermath of a mass shooting, Jillian and I may receive 50 to 100 media requests in a 24 hour period. And our inboxes are completely uh, bombarded and we don't really know what to do with them all. But what we've really tried to be do doing with this is to speak to everybody. So one of the things that we've been really successful in is we will talk to Fox News and we'll talk to MSNBC and we'll do it on exactly the same day and we'll say exactly the same thing to both. And what's been remarkable about that is the way in which the project has been able to transcend those kind of political lines that usually hold us up from moving forward with this type of work. Now, being a public criminologist also means working with policymakers and practitioners. Our work has been featured in amicus briefs for the Supreme Court. It's been part of the uh, conversations around the bipartisan gun safety bill that was passed last year, in addition to other federal and state and local uh, policy efforts. We've testified in front of the House, the Senate, at the local levels to try and advance this type uh, of understanding of a holistic solution to gun violence. We collaborated locally in Minnesota with our Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, for instance, to try and get them more resources for a new uh, anonymous reporting application uh, to get that out to schools if people wanted to report threats of violence. And we are now collaborating with the St. Paul Public Schools on a new project, which is trying to evaluate the state of violence in those schools, and then also advance that work to create a customized school safety protocol, which includes hiring violence prevention community specialists to be doing this work in the school system. So I will conclude by saying this, the Violence Project has been without question the most rewarding experience of my professional life. I've got the opportunity to spend time with survivors of shootings, victims' families, spend entire weekends with perpetrators' families to understand their perspective and their lives. And the opportunities that this project has afforded us have been at times completely overwhelming and have really uh, taken this project to another level. It is, like I say, a, a privilege to be part of this type of research and to really feel like you're making a difference, which I think is what all academics want when they enter this profession. But at the same time, it's challenging work. Jillian and I have received death threats for the things that we do. Um, Jillian presently, uh, her office on campus is unmarked and is next to the security department because of those death threats. We uh, continue to receive way more emails than we can ever respond to from concerned parents, from school district leaders, from people who just want time to talk about these issues and do something about them. There's also some, at times, issues within the academy around doing this type of work. People feel like you're selling out or you're not really doing real academic research because your statistics are only descriptive, for example. And this is frustrating if we really want to be in the endeavor of advancing research that can have an impact on a public uh, level with policy and practice. And I think as well, it's challenging from a time uh, perspective when you think about the additional demands that public criminology places on academics beyond the already huge demands and challenges of an academic career. And a lot of this stuff, by the way, is not supported, is not funded, is not going to look good in your tenure and promotion packets because of the incentive structures that exist 
within the system. But personally, I wouldn't change it for the world. And so with that, I thank you for your time here today. And I'm very happy to answer any and all questions uh, in the spirit of public criminology uh, about this project. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop share and uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for that awesome presentation. And I think we will go right to uh, to questions and, and start with Sandra here. If anyone else has a question, though, um, do feel free, um, you know, just raise your hand if you want to just speak it to James directly. Um, if you're on YouTube, type it into the chat. And if you're on Zoom and you don't want to, uh, you're a little shy, you don't want to uh, ask Dr. Densley directly, just type it into the chat and I will read it out for you. So go ahead, Sandra. Thank you. And thank you, James. This was super fascinating, especially the uh, public dimensions to it and sort of like the public and policy work. Um, my question is, uh, obviously, from a Canadian standpoint, um, or I'm European, so maybe from a, from a non-American standpoint, um, I, I do understand the importance of understanding who the shooter is and what shooters are going through. And all of that is, um, you know, fascinating about your research and your work. Um, but of course, as a non-American, the go-to question would be, well, what about gun control laws? Because re really, I mean, the mass shootings that you're describing uh, only happen to that extent in the United States. And I guess my question for you is not so much um, why you didn't talk about that in this presentation. My question is more, is the reason why you're not foregrounding that potentially um, because you're trying to um, disseminate your knowledge uh, to the public? Um, so is that a way to maybe not touch on these political sticking points, as you said, to, to get the public on board? And, and do you find that to be the more uh, maybe successful way of going about that? That's a, that's a fantastic question. And I'll, I'll, try, and, I'll try and answer it uh, on multiple levels because it's a, it's a great question. So we have a chapter in the book, it's the second chapter of the book, it's titled America. And, you know, I'm a sociologist by training. And so we do have this kind of like cultural look at the U.S. of what makes it exceptional with this regard. And you know, other research has also looked at this, too. I don't want to claim all the credit for this. There's some great work. Adam Lankford, for instance, is, a, is an individual who's done some great work in this area. And, um, you know, um, the United States has six or seven times its share of mass shootings, right, compared to other com comparable nations. And so there's lots of explanations for like why that might be the case in terms of American history and culture and individualism and all those other things. But of course, guns is a big part of it. So the uh, eighth chapter of our book is all about opportunity. And that's the space where we really do dive into America's gun culture. It, it's uh, you know the huge access to firearms that you have in the United States all the different policies around gun safety, universal background checks, assault weapons bans, waiting periods, um, and so on. We go into all that in, in a lot of detail. But you're absolutely right that if you enter the conversation and it's just about the guns, half of the room shuts down and they just don't listen to everything else that you have to say. And so we have found that strategically, you have to have that sensitive balance of, yes, it is the guns. There's no question it is the guns. But it's also the guns layered on these other things, too. And it's being able to kind of navigate that in a way that, that ensures that people don't shut down and that they continue to engage in the work, which is really important. And I'll just share one other thing, which is our database is focused in the United States. And we did this work with a number of volunteers, uh, many of which were undergraduate students, actually, which is also a huge thing. Working with undergraduates was fantastic. But we tasked some students at one point to try and build a comparable database for Canada. And we said, you know, 
have a look around, look at some cases, come back to us, and we'll see whether or not we have the resources to do it. And they came back to us about an hour later, and they said, yeah, there's been like eight cases or something. And <laughs> we were just like, oh, I guess we don't need to do that then, um, versus you know the nearly 200 that are in our uh, our US database. So um, we, but we have talked about you know adding Europe, adding Canada, and uh, and and that might be a future project. So yeah, thank you. Germany is actually the country you need to look at. They have yeah. Nice Anyhow, okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Jeff, I have a question. Go ahead, Toby. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, thanks, James. That was amazing. I, I absolutely enjoyed every part of, of your presentation. So uh, thank, you. thank you for that. So I wanted to know um, what your experience has been like vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, the reception of political leaders um, to some of the ideas that you have put out. Uh, my experience in Canada, well, specifically in Alberta, has been that access even at the highest level uh, of government does not always guarantee change um, the tendency is towards relatively half uh, half measures as, as a sort of hybridized response uh, a kind of balancing act between the ideological commitment of the the party in power uh, and the recommendations that you make and that's not to say that they ignore or reject your recommendations they know these are good recommendations and they are, you know, uh, socio-scientifically sound, but th there is that uh, base that's out there. It's a, what, and, and this is not like a necessarily a conservative thing. There's this cuts across uh, various political parties. So what has been your experience in the States? I saw that picture where you were in front of the, uh, I believe it was the Minnesota House. Um, what, what has that been like? Are they uh, putting into policies, putting into law, um, some of the recommendations that you've been making? And if yes, they, they really go into full hog or are you finding that they, they're sort of tweaking things and in the end, they, the product gets so watered down that you go, okay, what is this about? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. That, another great question. Yeah. So I think, you know, what's interesting when we very first started the work, you know, we weren't seasoned lobbyists and, you know, skilled at working with politicians. And to be honest, we kind of uh, stumbled into this when we had these opportunities to kind of testify and we didn't know what the rules and regulations were. And I mean, I'm originally from Great Britain anyway. So like this whole thing was new. Um, but what has been quite surprising is the politicians that have read our work prior to, you know, these conversations, and then have then sort of encouraged us to be as open and transparent in the conversations as possible, as if everything's on the table. And then recognizing, you know, what might be politically advantageous or not is going to sort of dictate the outcomes. But one of the most incredible things that happened recently um, was we were testifying uh, in the Minnesota House and they, they said, does anyone from the floor also want to testify? And the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus testified. And I'll be honest, I thought, oh boy, um, what, what's about to happen here? And they said that we would like to support the work that the Violence Project is doing, um, we believe that they are taking a truly nonpartisan, unbiased approach to the work. And even though we may not fully agree with their recommendations on gun safety, um, they're going about it in, a, in the right way. And we don't have any complaints about that. And they sat back down again. And, and I was just like, wow that that i was not expecting that at all and i think it it was a sign for us that we'd been able to kind of break down some of the political barriers um that we were actually getting democrats and republicans agreeing on things and and talking to one another and being a little bit more collaborative about things because they could find value 
in lots of different recommendations that they could then turn into uh, potential policy, as opposed to just going down the path of one recommendation that perhaps doesn't get us anywhere. But um, but yeah, so hopefully that that answers the question. But uh, but I agree, it's it's been a challenge, uh, and it's, it's it's a new world for both uh, Gillian and I uh, navigating some of this. Thank you. Okay, yeah, the uh, the distinguished chair of our department, Dr. Haggerty, has a, a question. Uh, You're muted, Kevin. Yeah, yeah Kevin, muted. I unfortunately can't hear you. Oh. Ah, yes, that, okay. that's great. Okay, sorry, um, configurations. Um, yeah, I love the talk, and I, I loved your piece in recently in the New York Times. I shared it widely, so thank you. Thank you. So, so the question is, notwithstanding this gun ownership group, my cynicism is, is it possible that the ship has sailed on this issue? That a significant proportion of the American electorate has essentially normalized gun mass shootings as a risk of urban environments the same way as traffic accidents or train derailments or whatever and it's just a part of the a part of the ethos at this point yeah you you really speak to i think a fear that many i believe really came to that type of a conclusion after the uh, horrific shooting at sandy hook elementary school um, where many people sort of came to that conclusion of, well, if, you know, the murder of 26 school children isn't enough to move the needle on this, then what possibly could be? And a lot of people became very despondent and disgruntled around the political process uh, following that. Um, I'm still optimistic that there's progress to be made here, but I'm also not naive to think that it's going to be easy and that we're going to get sweeping change because particularly in the US, the recent Supreme Court decisions seem to be really erring more on the side of this right to bear arms as an individual right for self-protection as opposed to the protection of the state. And that we are seeing increasingly permissive gun laws throughout the country, which are really making this more difficult to uh, to achieve. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of like, but you don't want to give up the fight um, because it's worth fighting for. And I think we just have to continue to be very data driven and let the evidence speak for the need for action on these. But I certainly have experienced a little bit of, of that myself with the most recent mass shootings. I remember doing a little bit of, uh, you know, some media work after the most recent ones in California and feeling like, wow, I've now said this exact same thing, you know, after the last mass shooting and the last mass shooting and the last mass shooting. And here we go. It's like, you know, rinse and repeat. And um, that that can be tough. That can be tough that you're in that you're in that cycle. So uh, I, I, I certainly hear that. And uh you know, we just got to keep, just got to keep trying to let the evidence win out. Thank you. Okay, uh, maybe I guess Will, you'll be our, our last official question because we're we're right up against uh, an hour here. But go ahead. Uh, thanks so much for the really interesting presentation. It's just very interesting to hear this going forward. Really brilliant work. Um, my question is about the public sociology thing, which is very clearly a massive part of what you're doing. Um, what are your rec? I mean, and you talked a little bit about the trade offs and stuff, but what are your some of your recommendations in terms of uh, how how could how can others do uh, public sociology more effectively? What are some of your kind of learnings and uh, warnings about that? And how, especially for people who are perhaps in the earlier career stages, what are your recommendations in terms of how to do this effectively without potentially harming your longer term academic career? Because unfortunately, those ten year packages are what drive you for those first five years when sometimes you have the best opportunity to do public sociology? Yeah, that's a really great question. And, and there's no question, I think, that, you know, 
Number one, I teach uh, at more of a teaching institution, uh, as does uh, Jillian, that uh, has slightly different incentives. And, you know, both of us were already tenured and more senior faculty when we had these opportunities. And so I guess our decision making was was different around some of this. Um, but that being said, I think it's important to try and foster an environment that encourages researchers to take a little bit more risks with this type of work and as best they can to incentivize this. Um, you know, and it, there's also variations and gradations of all this stuff as well. But like, I will say this, our experience working on that New York Times piece that was that was mentioned, you know, that was about three months in the making with uh, the editors there. And the legal team at the New York Times, the fact checking team at the New York Times, the editorial team at the New York Times, um, and the process of actually just getting like into the New York Times, like was a thousand times more rigorous than any academic peer review I've ever been through. Um, and so I would say that that should be held at a similar level as like, well, you published in this top tier journal, right? But unfortunately, that doesn't necessarily always work out that way when you go up for those tenure and promotions. So sometimes I think we might need to take a step back and ask, you know, what is scholarship? And what is impact? And is it always by these traditional measures or can it be achieved in other ways as well? And can we uh, give credit where credit is due when people are doing those types uh, of things? At the same time, can we also provide support for the kind of risks that come with it? Um, you know, give people an opportunity to fail, um, to make mistakes, but not let that you know, uh, dictate the trajectory of their career going forward. And one of the pieces around this is, you know, academia is hard, right? Uh, anyone who's in it on here knows it's stressful and it's competitive and it's busy and it's long hours and, you know, you move around and you don't get time with your loved ones. And we could talk all day about those challenges. You know, we also talk about, though, that you need to support academics to be successful. and those rules apply just as much as if you're writing a book or writing a peer reviewed article as if you're writing an op-ed or if you're going to appear on the media. Can we train academics in those areas? Can we provide them with support in those areas? Um, can PhD programs uh, think about ways to collaborate more with unconventional outlets for dissemination? Um, getting them in front of journalists. I know at the American Society of Criminology annual conference, for instance, they often do that kind of journalist uh, pre-conference meeting. Those types of things I think are really great initiatives to be thinking about how do people consume information in the modern day? And how can we make sure that we stay relevant as researchers, as the world around us changes and shifts, and as people move more to social media and online? Uh, and, and, and do it in a way that's not going to harm the prospects of your career uh, going forward. So I would just like to see a little bit more support for that type of work, um, recognition of the, the pros and cons of it. And uh, maybe we can also be maybe more strategic about it uh, going forward to ensure that people can be successful with it. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Densley. That was Great. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to shut off the live stream and the recording uh, so that basically if you want to chat with with James, um, if he's free to stick around for a couple minutes, we can do that, you know, without the, uh, the pressure so, yeah. on video. Uh, I just want to say one quick announcement before I, I do that. Uh, next month, we've got our sixth and final speaker of the year coming up on March 31st. It is Walter de Cesaretti, and he'll be giving a talk very apropos for uh, for Northern Alberta. A New Theory of Globalization, Natural Resource Extraction, and Violence Against Women Towards Solving the Linkage Problem. So keep an eye on our social media. And if you're at U of A, um, we'll have that going out by email. And, uh, you know, I think we're in Artstown Crier and all the kind of big newsletters now. And on, on our website, the CCR website, um, you can find all of the announcements for our events there. All right. So thank